I've been reading a, a book by a fellow that you may have come across on Discover TV or uh, some of the uh, documentaries that appear from time to time about Bible history. His name is John Dominic Crozan. Uh, he is the one who founded the Jesus Seminar. Perhaps you've heard that uh, description before. It's a group, a kind of think tank that is focused on discovering the, the, the real Jesus. Uh, and so uh, John Dominic Crozan has written a book on uh, God and Empire in which he talks about the juxtaposition of the Roman Empire in particular and the great power and violence of that civilization as it made its way into uh, Palestine in particular, and then what he perceives to be the uh, response on the part of those like Jesus and the Apostle Paul uh, to this incursion of violence. And in his perception, his idea, Jesus and Paul and the rest of the New Testament, at least in terms of his perception of the original uh, true Jesus, uh, responded in a non-violent way to the violence of civilization. And so Jesus uh, taught his disciples to turn the other cheek. Jesus himself would give up his life and would die at the hands of the Roman state. Uh, Non-violence. And so he makes this point that the Jesus of the Gospels that we need to return to is the Jesus of nonviolence. Maybe another Mahatma Gandhi, uh, another Martin Luther King Jr., another who advocates this idea of nonviolence. <clears throat> the ideas of violence and force come into play here in this particular chapter in Matthew's Gospel, the 11th chapter. Violence is begun to reveal itself against the ministry of Jesus and especially that of John the Baptist. The Baptist is now sitting in a prison, in Herod, Herod's prison, Herod Antipas. The prison was uh, called Machaerus and it was located uh, by, the, uh, by the Dead Sea, about 50 miles east and, and south, where Herod Antipas had built a palace for himself and there he has this prison. This prison was a horrible place. Uh, just a, a concrete cell that you would sit in with uh, holes drilled in the walls and you would be chained to that cell. And here was John the Baptist, who perhaps had the temerity to speak out against Herod Antipas and his uh, unlawful marriage. John, now in prison, the one who pointed to the coming of the Messiah and proclaimed that this one would baptize the world with the Holy Spirit and fire. This one who came with the, the axe, which was already laid at the root of the trees. John was expecting some great things of this Messiah. But here he languishes in a prison under a godless man. Was John right? Perhaps he began to have some second thoughts about his mission some th second thoughts about the one that he identified as the Christ, the one whom he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John perhaps was beginning to have some questions. And so he gathers some of his disciples, apparently who had an opportunity or occasion to visit him from time to time, and he says to them, Go to Jesus and say, Are you the one that we were to expect, or should we look for somebody else? In other words, I'm having trouble recognizing you in comparison with my understanding of the scriptures and what they told the coming one. You don't seem to be doing all that I expected. Am I missing something? John is perplexed. He's struggling. Perhaps we can sympathize with John from time to time. We look at the kingdom of God and its work in the world today and we wonder, what is God doing? This does not seem to be happening according to my timetables or my schedule. It does not seem to be occurring with the great force that I had hoped for. What is God doing in the world today? And perhaps it 
might cause you to question or doubt. Is this Jesus really the one that I should follow? Some, like Chrisan, go back to the scriptures and they reinterpret everything and try to fit their understanding of Jesus, what they perceive to be happening in the world all around them. And they can form Jesus into their own mold of interpretation. And Jesus becomes a prophet of nonviolence. Someone who would conform with the current worldview. Do you need to reinterpret your ideas of Jesus? John sends his disciples to Jesus and they come to him while Jesus had, had sent his disciples off, instructed them in terms of establishing his gospel in the various cities. And now they come to Jesus, the disciples of John come to Jesus and they raise the question that John asks and, and how does Jesus respond to him? Does he rebuke him outright? Saying, how can you doubt me? How can you question me? What's wrong with you? No, he answers John in a very subtle, gentle way. In some respects, he reads back to John the very things that John was observing. Almost telling John, this is what you expected, or this is what you were looking for, and this is what is happening. You know that I am giving sight to the blind, opening the ears of those who can't hear, uh, enabling the lame to walk. Jesus was engaged in a ministry of works that was powerful, a powerful ministry of healing and help. And John heard these things, and that wasn't quite fitting into his eschatology because he thought of Jesus more as the one who was bringing history to a close, who would bring judgment on the nations and establish himself, perhaps on earth, as the king over all. What's all this healing? Jesus says, I am healing people. But the way that Jesus reads back the account of his works is to do it in such a way that John will begin to recognize the message of the prophets of long ago. This is the very thing that was foretold by Isaiah the prophet in this 35th chapter, and also Isaiah chapter 61, where he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he begins talking about how the Spirit enables him to open the eyes of the blind and the ears of those who are deaf. And the gospel is preached to the poor. Interestingly, Jesus does not mention it here, but in both of those texts, there is a reference to the day of the Lord's vengeance. And so what Jesus is saying to John is that all that you are expecting is occurring. According to the scriptures, you need to open your mind and see once more what God is doing. His work will be much bigger than what John anticipated. His first coming will be a coming in mercy and in grace, a proclaiming of salvation. There would yet come a time when he would come in wrath and in judgment, when the wrath of God will be demonstrated upon all the wicked at the last day. But for the moment he came in mercy and grace. How do you interpret Jesus? Do you accept the way that he came to the world in that day, in mercy and in grace, rather than an outward display of wrath and justice? Jesus tells the disciples that blessed is the one who does not take who does not take offense at me, does not stumble over me. And so he, he encourages John not to uh, get upset over what he's seeing, but to realize that this is according to God's plan and God's purpose. He comes to bring salvation. And so he corrects John's misunderstanding of his work and broadens his view. Sometimes we have to have our eyes open to the broader context of God's kingdom and the spiritual purposes that are at work in the world today. We might look for God's judgments and wrath, but 
But sometimes we need to also look for God's mercy and grace. And keep in mind that He's come to bring salvation to many. Well, John's disciples leave. And Jesus begins to turn to the audience that was with him. And perhaps they were beginning to have questions about John. How could John doubt Jesus? Who is this John? Jesus does not criticize John, but rather he supports John. He uh, reminds the people who John really is. You know, there are times in our life when we stumble and fall. There are times when we don't quite live up to our Christian profession. Those times do not, should not cloud the greater work that we've done in Christ's church. Christ looks at the good things that have been accomplished through us and rejoices in those. And so he says about John, who did you go out to see out in the wilderness? A reed shaken by the wind? <clears throat> Somebody who put his finger up in the air to see where uh, the, the popular opinion was and went after that? Not John. He stood out and gave a very unpopular message. Repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand. And then began to speak directly to the people. These are your sins. This is what you must do to repent. He was not an easy man to be around. But the strength of his character, the strength of his commitments are what drew people to him. He did not say, I suggest or I surmise or you know, perhaps you might consider. He said, you must repent. He spoke with authority. And people came to that. We need to be reminded of that. Christian preaching is not merely encouragements, wonderful suggestions, encouraging you to develop your own ideas and pursue your own uh, direction in life. No, it is a message of authority. God speaks. And the one who occupies the pulpit or whoever opens the word of God before you should speak with that divine authority. And not back away from it. John spoke directly. Jesus says, did you go out to find someone who had uh, soft clothing? Somebody who wore the latest fashions by uh, Ralph Lauren. I hope to sport a Ralph Lauren jacket this afternoon. <laughs> People are not going to come to see that, but maybe you will now. <laughs> but they didn't come out to see John because he was making a fashion statement. In fact, he made kind of a, a contrary fashion statement with his rough clothing and his rude lifestyle. He was not a fashion star. He lived a simple life, utterly committed to his message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Don't worry about how you look. Don't worry about what fashions you might present. Preach Christ. Be who you are. Redeemed in Christ. And that will attract people to you. More so than dressing up as the world looks for. Trying to appear in the way that they like. And that's kind of the thing today in churches. Dress down, dress casual. Preach Christ. That's what counts. It doesn't matter what you're wearing up front. Whether it's a gown, suit, slacks, whatever. Preach Christ. So, Jesus reminds people of who they saw in John. But then he says, as great as John was, as powerful as he was as a prophet, he was even more than the other prophets. He was the one who announced the kingdom of God. He pointed to the Christ. He was the one who the prophets even foretold was coming. Yet Jesus turns to his disciples and says, you are greater than John. What? This rabble of folks out in the wilderness coming to hear Jesus, these people are greater than John the prophet? Yes. 
Because you see that which John himself did not realize or fully understand. John did not fully see the result of. You see the Christ. And you will see him go to the cross to lay down his life for sinners. You will see him rise from the dead. You will see him ascend into the heavens. You will see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You will see the preaching of the gospel to the nations of the world. You will see the nations of the world come to faith in Christ. Your position is far greater than that of John's. You have so much more given to you. It's not that John was not a part of the kingdom. He just did not see all the privileges of the kingdom that were yet to open up at that moment in the ministry of Christ. You are greater than John because you have far greater privileges. Much more is given to you. Remember in the 13th chapter, and we might get to this in the near future, Jesus has these parables that he tells, and he says, to you the things of the kingdom are given. But the rest are given parables. Much more is given to you in this age. God gives you greater power for advancing His work in the world today than was ever evident in the past because He's poured out His Spirit upon you. And that brings us to these words of Jesus that commentators have discussed and, and, and argued over, and you find it even in our translations. The kingdom of heaven in the English Standard Version is suffering violence. And violent men grab a hold of it. And, and this idea of, of violence uh, comes against the kingdom of God and the kingdom as it were suffers in these ways. And you can see a context for that. John is in prison. Uh, there's greater hostility arising against Jesus and the disciples. Before long he will be executed on a Roman cross. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And violent men take it, attack it. Part of that is the nature of being in the kingdom of God. You need to understand that the kingdom suffers violence and it continues to do so today. But these words can also be taken in a more, shall we say, forceful sense a more aggressive sense. And the New International Version translates it like this, that the kingdom of God advances forcefully and forceful, forceful men lay hold of it. That interpretation too is true in that the kingdom of God will advance in the midst of all these things. God's kingdom is accomplishing great and powerful things. Jesus is opening the eyes of the blind. That has never been done before. Excuse me. Demons are being driven out. The dead are being raised. Here is power evident in the world. The kingdom of God was striking at the foot of Daniel's statue. And the Roman Empire would collapse through this forceful advance of the kingdom of God. And God's kingdom continues to advance forcefully in the world today in spite of the violence brought against it in spite of the hostility of people who try to afflict the, the church of Jesus Christ. It continues to go forward. And then that second part, forceful men lay hold of it. It's a reminder that when the gospel comes to us, it calls us to repent of our sins and we need to make a dramatic change in our lives. Putting away our old self, our old habits, our old way of life, and pursuing a new course in service to God in accord with His will. And the changes are powerful and dramatic, and sometimes to pursue them, you have to flee everything, put everything aside. Sometimes you have to leave family, you have to leave friends, maybe your job, you may have to leave your community to follow Christ. And you are ready to give up it all because of the great value of serving Christ. Because of the wonder of His love and the great salvation that He's provided. 
Remember the parable that Jesus tells of the treasure out in the field. And the man who sells everything that he possesses in order to obtain that treasure. Forceful men take hold of the kingdom. They're empowered by the Spirit. Their eyes are open. Their ears are open. They see the kingdom of God. And now they run into that kingdom. And take it with all that they are. Doesn't that not speak to your heart? Did you not plead with God for His mercies? Seek His grace and favor? Pursue Him despite the uh, mockery, the slanders, the accusations of others all around you. You continue to follow Christ. Forceful men take that kingdom. This past week we've seen both force and violence. We've seen the, the powerful force of a tornado come across the Oklahoma Plains, attacking the city of Moore, leveling it, wiping a whole section of it to a rubble. Amazing video occurred as helicopter teams were off in the distance viewing the formation of the storm and the set down of the funnel and the expansion of that funnel until it was two miles wide. Destroying everything in its path. Then we saw on TV this horrible image of this assault in London. I hesitate to even say anything about it. It's so gruesome. We live in a world of violence and force. But there's a kingdom of God by the grace of God, by the mercies of God, that's also at work in the world today, bringing light, salvation, hope, everlasting peace and joy through Jesus Christ. And we are those who, like John long ago, can go out into the world and proclaim this gospel to the nations of the world and bring them to a wonderful Savior who will deliver us from the force and violence of this world and make us strong in Christ to do greater things than even John did. May God grant you grace and strength to advance His kingdom in the world today. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we look on our world and are perplexed by the kinds of things that take place within it, we pray that you'd help us to listen once more to the Scriptures and all that you have to say and begin to interpret our world in the light of the Scriptures, and not merely in light of our own expectations. We pray, Lord, that you would grant us grace, that we'd see the glory of the Kingdom of Christ, the majesty of His person, and the great grace and salvation that He brings. And we pray that you would stir up within our hearts a love for our Savior, a determination to serve Him, to be faithful witnesses in the world today, and we pray that the light of the gospel would shine forth powerfully in our hearts, in our lives, in this church, and throughout the earth, that Christ's kingdom would advance. We ask it in his name.